Greetings, everyone. I'm excited to welcome Michael Zerker, CEO and co-founder of Prismatic. Michael, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you here. Let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Prismatic. We are an in embedded integration platform vendor. Uh, prior to that, I had another software startup that I um, founded and ran for about 16 years. Ran into a lot of integration challenges at that previous business, which after I, after I sold it to private equity, ended up on, on the Prismatic track, trying to solve some of the problems that we had, had previously. Well, that's awesome. Now, and is your background, is it business? Is it technical? Tell us a little bit about your, 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 your background. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm technical by, by trade. I think I, you know, did an electrical engineering degree in, in college, did a lot of open source software stuff back in the, in the early 2000s, long, long, long ago now, but, you know, was, was a contributor on the open source front there and kind of picked up software along the way. But, you know, here I am almost 20 years into running software companies. So I think at this point, I have to consider myself a, a software guy. Yeah, I'd say you're a veteran at this point, especially, yeah, 16 years with a one run with a company. Now, I don't know what you can disclose with that, but how big did you get that company before you exited the PE? Yeah, so I actually had kind of like two exits in a way. We bootstrapped to about 10 million in revenue and then were acquired by a, a platform company that Insight Venture Partners had in 2015. And so we put the, put the two organizations together at that point, but really left my piece of it independent in name and building and everything else. And we kept growing. We then grew about 50 million in revenue over the next two and a half years or so, and then, then sold it to Bain Capital. So oh, wow. kind of, I kind of saw the whole, the whole run from bootstrap to a million, then bootstrap to 10 million, then PE to 50 million. Had a lot of varying experiences throughout that whole thing. Oh, I'm sure a ton of experience. We could talk for hours, I'm sure. But yeah, that's a great, <laughs> great accomplishment. Hitting boots, yeah, bootstrap to 10 million. That's a, that's a big number, which yeah, definitely opens you up to a lot of buyers, so yeah. that's great. But let's let's talk about your current, I don't call it startup, but your current endeavor right now at yeah, Prismatic. Yeah. You know, tell us what products or services Prismatic offers. Sure, so you know, Prismatic helps other software companies connect their product to the other products that their customers use. So if we look at you know, just about any SaaS company today, integrations is a key part of their offering. It's different in different vertical markets. It, it, it kind of part is, uh, paid differently uh, by different vendors. But at the end of the day, there are very few offerings anymore that don't need some kind of integration. And, uh, you know, the reality is that's put a big burden on SaaS companies over the years. And I think it's increasingly putting a large burden on SaaS companies. So Prismatic sells a platform that helps those companies as effectively and efficiently as possible deliver that kind of like first class native integration uh, experience in their product, but way behind the scenes is Prismatic making everything better, uh, you know, even though end users don't usually know that we're even involved. Yeah, it makes sense. So is this, instead of that company, that the development team creating their own integration to all these different platforms, which, you know, hundreds, thousands out there that you could integrate to, you're doing that, building that integration so they can just, is it kind of just plug and play the integration into their product? Yeah, you know, the way that we talk about it is that, you know, if you think about an integration between any two products, there are, there are a bunch of different things that need to be accomplished by a software team. Some of it is just like the, the guts, the plumbing that's not sexy and not really even unique to a market. And then some of it is hyper unique to the problem that's being solved or the customer or whatever. What we, what we aim to do and what I think we're having a lot of success with is kind of replacing all of the pieces of that that are horizontal because it doesn't make sense for every SaaS company to reinvent that wheel. What we don't do is the pieces that are really unique to a vertical market, really unique to an offering, really unique to a customer base. Because our customer, the SaaS company that uses us, is going to always have a much better feel for, for that piece of it. So what we really want to do is we want to reduce slash eliminate the time being spent on, on the things that aren't of high value, such that a software company can focus all the time that it's going to spend on the things that you know, are true differentiators and true core competency. Okay. In the, so I help a lot of SaaS, SaaS founders and usually their accounting platform is QuickBooks, for example. So if I was a SaaS company, I have a product I want to integrate to QuickBooks, then I could come to you? 100%. Yep. Okay. Would, we would provide not just some of the plumbing behind the scenes, but also a nice marketplace so that their end users could authenticate against QuickBooks without them having to build that experience. Okay. Uh, just kind of like end to end, solve that integration problem for, for SaaS companies. Okay. Okay. It makes perfect sense. And then who are you targeting? Are you going after the CTO? You're going after the engineering team to prospect and, and get into these SaaS companies? 
Yeah, we very much have two personas that we market to and sell to. It's the the CTO or some kind of engineering leader, and then it's the CPO or some kind of product leader. Often our, our kind of like first contact is with a product leader. They're often the ones out there saying, hey, you know, 70% of our pipeline needs integrations that we don't have yet or something like that. Let's go, let's go figure out how to accelerate. But then immediately upon the product leader finding us or getting interested, then we get involved, uh, you know, obviously with the engineering team and kind of get into a, a pretty deep evaluation from that perspective. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then any, say for these SaaS companies, is there a nice sweet spot as far as revenue range? Or can you work with someone who's just starting up to say a hundred million SaaS, hundred million AR SaaS company? Yeah, we, we span the gamut pretty well. We, you know, we certainly have some early stage companies. We also have a handful of Fortune 500 companies that use our product. So I think we, I think we span that range. You know, as you kind of alluded to, there, there is kind of a sweet spot in, in the middle, I guess, where, you know, I always say companies are big enough to have these problems, but small enough to still be able to solve them. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's obviously a time when a company is very likely to be out looking for a solution like us. And so we have a lot of, you know, call it series A through C or something companies, you know, that, that use us. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So what year did you found Prismatic? We started Prismatic in 2019. 2019. Okay. And then do you have a headquarters location or are you virtual? We don't. We're completely remote. You know, my last business was built here in Sioux Falls, where I'm based, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So uh, a slightly disproportionate number of our employees are here just because of the network effect of, of the last business. But, you know, at this point, even that's a pretty small minority of the company. We're, we're truly all over the place. Yeah. We have so common every time I ask that question. So rarely is it, yeah, we're... In the city, and yeah. that's our HQ. But, I mean, it would be neat if life was that simple, but yeah. uh, it no longer is. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then what's your current team size? Uh, we're about 50 people. 50, okay. And anything you want to share around revenue ranges, era ranges that you're comfortable with? We don't share revenue ranges. I mean, what I can say is that we've we've just been, you know, growing really rapidly now for several years in a row. And anybody who knows how compound curves works knows that we're, you know, we're making some progress and yeah. Yeah. after a handful of years put together. Okay. Well, that's great. So tell us a little bit about your go-to-market motion. How are you reaching out to these CPOs and CTOs? Yeah. I mean, at this point, you know, just as we've started to kind of, you know, approach the beginnings of, of the scaling process, we, at this point are, are in a lot of channels, but, you know, we do, we do some outbound marketing with just email marketing and, and similar things. We've always had a very strong, you know, inbound component. You know, I think we, over the years have produced a lot of content that gets a lot of a lot of visibility. We've, you know, we do a lot of paid ads. We, I think at this point, just kind of span the, span the gamut, but uh, you know, it's an emerging category. It's a new category. And so I think a huge amount of what we've done for the last number of years is just education. And, okay. and, and I think, I think that will continue for a long time. In to find the, say CTOs, like, and you know, if they always, you'd always talk about like, where, where are your prospects hanging out? Yeah. So do you find that that's a good source then is just that educational content, SEO, they're searching for something, researching, which is not unexpected from a CTO yeah, and then exactly. landing on your site? Yeah, and that's exactly right. I mean, as your audience knows, CTOs, CPOs don't tend to be the ones that like raise their hand immediately to say, well, I, what I really want to do is be on an hour long sales call, right? Like they, they want to they self-consume as much as they can. And so, yeah, a, a large amount of our opportunities do a lot of you know, do a lot of their own research before they even reach out. You know, that's not always true, but it's, it's pretty common. Okay. Yeah. No, appreciate that insight. And let's switch to the fundraising side. How sure. much capital have you raised to date? To date, I believe we've raised 34 million. 34 million. Yep. It looks like a most recent round was a series B for 22. Yep. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Just, just closed our $22 million series B. That's right. Okay. And then tell us about that. Maybe since that's fresh in your memory, what what led you to that Series B? Were there triggers, there miles or milestones that said we're ready for that next capital raise? Yeah, to be honest, we actually raised it uh, a little earlier than we we expected to. You know, things have been going very well at Prismatic. We had a really great 2023 after raising our Series A, and, and I think we just looked around and and in so many ways it was just time to put more you know put more foot on the accelerator, as it were, and uh, it was just the right time to do it. We we were fortunate that our our lead investor on our Series A was really interested in the Series B and they stepped up and, and we just decided to do that together. So in a lot of ways, we kind of got off got off a little bit easy with the Series B and, and just got right back to work. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to tell them everything again if they've yeah. already invested. Yeah. yeah. Been on the board since the day they invested in the Series A. So they know as much as, as much as you ever would through diligence. 
I made it, I made it straightforward. And did you follow that sequential path path? I'm sure. So maybe C series A, series B. We were, you know, because of my previous exit, we were kind of able to bootstrap most of the way to series A. We we took a little bit of seed, but it was it was kind of largely bootstrapped and self-funded. The first real institutional investor was 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 the series A. Okay. Okay. That's great. And then whether it's Series A or Series B, and any fundraising lessons that you'd like to share with the, the the SaaS community that just stands out when you think back to those fundraising sessions? I mean, I don't know that I have any like silver bullet lessons or anything, but I, I certainly would say that, you know, in the current environment, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity about things, multiples weren't what they were in 2021, et cetera, et cetera. But I just keep seeing time and time again, both with Prismatic and with Various companies we work with or companies that I have some relationship with, you know, I, I think I think companies that are doing well and and have a business model that actually, you know, works in this environment are continuing to do well on the fundraising side. I don't think multiples are exactly what they were in 2021, but I also don't think that's, you know, the most important thing. I think you can build a very successful business that is, you know, that's backed by institutional investors today, just like you could two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. So I guess my biggest thing is certainly it is a different climate than it was in 2021. And for founders where, you know, their only thing they're pattern matching against was 2020, 2021, 2022, I can imagine today feels, feels sad. But, uh, you know, I think if you look at it in any broader context, you know, I think it's just the ebbs and flows of a market. And I don't think anybody should, should hesitate starting something or, or putting more capital into something. We certainly have had a really good, you know, really good experience ourselves. No, that's great. It's a great point because we look at that macro environment. Maybe we're scared away, right? Valuations are down or not what they used to, but good businesses, good, solid businesses can still get funding, can still get nice exits, you know, so we shouldn't be afraid that, yeah, if you're running a great business, a lot of things are still possible. Yeah, that's absolutely the way I look at it. And, you know, I think our experience over the last few years has kind of made me believe that's that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, appreciate that insight. So, Michael, based on the your current stage of your business, do you have a favorite number or metric or maybe even metrics that you're focused on to guide the business? Well, I mean, favorite number is always ARR, right? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, about kind of, it all kind of boils down to that. But, you know, certainly we're just now starting to get to, you know, the very beginnings of the kind of scale where you, you know, where you really metric a lot of things. And, you know, I think we we pay a lot of attention to, I mean, gross margin, which which isn't super sexy anymore, but uh, I I guess I started early enough in the, you know, in the, in the whole cycle of businesses that I'm still pretty stuck on gross margin. So we pay a lot of attention to that and how that's going to scale as we grow. We pay a lot of attention to efficiency of our sales, sales motion. You know, it's fine for it to be inefficient for a while, as long as there are very clear reasons that it's inefficient and, and it's not structural to the point that, you know, you're, you're just building an inefficient business. You know, I think we're always really focused on that. Like everything we do has to be leading us toward a, a sanely structured business three or five years from now. And if we're going to make short-term sacrifices, that is completely fine. That's just what investment looks like. But we've got to be hyper-focused on it all being temporary and, and being really focused on a, on a structurally sound business in the end. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I'm going to have to get you on my newsletter because some of the, my recent posts have been on gross profit calculations, oh, really? margins by revenue stream. And you're right, fundamental financial analysis for SaaS companies, even before you get to metrics, understand your overall gross profit, your best in class consider around 80%, you know, looking at it by revenue stream. So maybe I'll put some of that in my show, show notes, but yeah, uh, absolutely. You've got to understand margin, how that scales. I have a feeling this is what your article was about, but I have such a pet peeve with people who just try to pull, like pull support or pull DevOps or something out of the, you know, out of cost of goods sold. Like that, that's just not an accurate look at the business guys. I'm sorry. It's just not. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of coaching calls on Cogs versus OpEx, SP okay. structure. We we could talk for hours on that, <laughs> but right, so important. Sales and marketing efficiency, of course, so important. And interesting about you said you know sanely structured. And I've talked to founders who've raised hundreds of millions of dollars, Not and it becomes, in their words, kind of a very methodical, formulaic process when you're trying to put that much capital in mm -hmm. use or deploying it in your business. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I you know we're. We're only at 34 and, and I, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward, I think, for us to figure out where to invest today. But, you know, I can understand how you could certainly get in a situation where you, you know, you essentially have more than you can make good use of in the short term. Yeah, definitely. And one, one more question before we get to the wrap up here, but tell us a little bit about your pricing model. I could see a lot of different ways to price this, but how are you pricing this with customers? 
Yeah, so we really have two pieces to our pricing model. The first is a, a subscription price, which is just to be on the platform. It gives you access to build on the platform and integrate it into your application and all those things. And there are a couple of different tiers of plans based on features and functionality. And then the other piece of it is a usage-based component. And so, you know, we have a metric that we call instances, which is basically every time you deploy an integration to a specific customer, that's one instance. And so it's essentially just a way to measure how much you're using a platform, how much value your customers are extracting from the platform. And, and we have a usage fee that, you know, gets kind of complex how it's all calculated, but, you know, lets customers kind of grow into the platform to some extent instead of have such a, a huge upfront cost. Yeah, it makes sense. And we know pricing iterates over time. It's, yep. it's like pricing never is never ending, mm -hmm. but where are you expecting to get most of your revenue from? Is it on the usage side or the subscription platform side? It's actually, it's actually pretty balanced today. Oh, balanced. Uh, okay. It'll, it'll keep, you know, it'll keep changing over time. There's some of the, just like the nature of a curve that keeps, keeps bending upwards is that you always have one piece lagging the other or whatever, but structurally it's fairly balanced. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate that insight because sometimes, right. Some companies mostly usage-based, a little platform fee, some vice versa. You just, yep. just, yeah, never know. Just yep. don't mix those, those, don't mix those revenue streams together on your p &L. So, well, Mike, yeah, appreciate that. And, and tell us what's coming up next for the company. So, I mean, we're at a really exciting point in our growth. We're in a, you know, we're in a new category. We are clearly one of the thought leaders in that category and, and having a great time doing it. We're growing like crazy and we've got a lot of dry powder now to execute over the next couple of years. So. I think, you know, what's next for us is largely continuing to do what we've been doing, but at a larger and larger scale. We've got some really exciting product announcements, one that came out a couple of weeks ago with kind of the overhaul of our of our designer experience, of our of our low-code experience. And we've got a couple more to come that are going to kind of, I think in some ways, change the way customers think about this category. So we're really excited about that in the next quarter or two. And I think it's it's all blue skies at the moment, but that can obviously change at any time. That's great. You have time to scale and execute. So Michael, really appreciate your time today, sharing your experiences. If listeners would like to learn more about Prismatic, where should we send them online? Yeah, you can absolutely follow us on, on LinkedIn or follow me personally. Also, prismatic.io is our website, and that's by far the best, you know, the best set of materials about us. Okay, sounds good. If you'd like to learn more about Michael and Prismatic, check out prismatic.io. And Michael, again, thanks for coming on and sharing your experiences. Yes, Ben, thanks so much for having me.